were talking about uh, senses and uh, sensory objects and uh, fetus arising through the contact and um, feeling, perceptions, desire, thinking, deliberating and all this. And also we mentioned this morning that we want to use uh, mindfulness and mindful reflection to get rid of them each time they arise. Most of the time we fail uh, because of our habitual way of uh, thinking, uh, entertaining and particularly not being uh, mindful and using mindful reflection, the fetus continue to grow. Uh, so when we realize there are danger and uh, uh, degradation and so forth, then we get encouraged to cultivate our mindful reflection. And we see the danger, when we see the danger, we will be disappointed with the, with the entertainment of uh, fetters. So Buddha said uh, in many places, those who delight in the senses, sensory objects, delight in suffering. <laughs> this is very famous uh, statement. Yobi keve chakkung abhinandati, chakkung sotang ghanang jiva kaya, and manang abhinandati so dukkhang abhinandati. That means because whoever enjoys the delights in entertaining eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind entertains suffering. <laughs> and he said, he is not free from suffering. Only when we pay mindful attention and uh, understand the meaning of this statement, then we begin to take it seriously, take uh, the entertaining uh, desire uh, seriously. So this will not happen all of a sudden, this takes, you know, many, uh, perhaps days, months, years to uh, get this uh, message across very clearly. Uh, and then we, pr we start reflecting mindfully to get rid of them. And try, Buddha said, try to cultivate the interest in solitude. And in the Buddhist uh, sense, solitude is uh, uh, not going away from uh, city, from the families uh, and living uh, somewhere. Uh, but 
he said, uh, so long as we do not understand the danger, degradation, and so forth of entertaining our sense pleasures, uh, we encourage a companion. What are, who are our companions? Here is what Buddha said, addressing to uh, Migaraja, he said, uh, there are forms, sound, cognizable by ear, smell, cognizable by nose, cognizable by taste, by uh, taste, cognizable by tongue, touch, cognizable by the body, mind, objects, cognizable by the mind. That are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing, if a bhikkhu seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, delights arises. When there is a delight, then there is infatuation. When there is infatuation, there is bondage, that is fetter. Bound by the fetter of delight, a bhikkhu is called one dwelling with a partner. His partner is this delight, this entertainment of sense pleasure. That means so long as one entertains sense pleasures, one is not alone, one has a companion. <laughs> that companion is, that companion is not outside, that companion is inside, in the mind. That is our fetter, bondage, desire. Where there is bondage, there is Mara. Because Mara loves to see people in bondage. This bondage, the fetter, is very difficult to um, get rid of. And to illustrate this, Buddha gave a very beautiful uh, simile. Uh, simile of uh, um, Vepachitti Bandhana. This is a mythological story. According to this mythological story, there is a fight between Sura and Asura, gods and demigods. They are not real devils, but some beings between devils and de uh, demons and uh, gods. They are called asuras. There is a, you know, interpretation of this term asura, how they became asura. They became asura. Uh, sura is uh, intoxicants. You know, we say sura meraya, they are sura means intoxicants. Sura means not intoxicated. The mythological story is that uh, asuras 
uh, in the in 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 the beginning don't ask me when the beginning was you know in the beginning <laughs> uh, were not drinking but the de the uh, deities cheated them they introduced them to drinking and they get, got drunk and therefore they was deities when they got drunk caught them by their feet and threw them out of heaven and they ended up in underworld and then they woke up regain their you know sanity they realized they have lost their divine pleasure so since then they lost their power and therefore they became asura but they conceived grudge against deities however after a while there also is a mythological tree that tree grows in asura's realms asura's realms and it reaches its branches uh, the suras devas realms the tree grows the root and the trunk is in the asuras realm and the branches reaches reach suras devas realms during flowering and uh, bearing fruit season these branches bear fruit and these fruits are in the suras devas realm because the branches are there so deities pick them and eat asuras nourish the root and take care of the tree but eventually fruit is <laughs> the deities take the advantage of the fruit they harvest the fruit and these fellows take care of the tree over that all this is mythological story over that there was a fight every time there is there are fruits on this uh, what you call pari chattaka tree there is a fight in this fight what is important is uh, not the tree or asura and so forth but the, but what uh, uh, the outcome of this fight the deities tell uh, his army or king of deity the uh, uh, sankra uh, king of deity tells his army in this battle if the asura king his name his name is vepachitti vepachitti if vepachitti lost in this battle bind him by his hands legs and neck in five places and bring him to me vepachi tells his army if deities lose bind the king of deities sakra by his two legs two hands and neck and bring to me this is the uh, what do you call prison of war how they treat the prison of war in this particular battle asuras king vepachitti lost so the king of deities uh, sakras uh, army bound him by his legs hands and neck brought to the king the, uh, the sakra now the trick is this the trap that if at any moment vepachitti thinks that the deities are right he is wrong that instant he will be uh, his bondage will be released he will be free and free to enjoy divine pleasure 
But the moment he thinks that he is right, the deities are wrong, he will be bound by these five places and he lose the opportunity to enjoy divine pleasure. Now, the Repa Chitti cannot do that because he thinks that Sagra betrayed him. They are wrong, they are unethical, immoral. In the first place, they made him drunk and threw out of heaven. Secondly, the tree that they grew, <laughs> the king of deities began to enjoy the fruit of the tree that they grew and took care of. So how can Vepachiti tells or thinks that Sakra is right, he is wrong. He cannot do that. And therefore he will never think that Sakra is right, he is wrong and he remains bound by these five places and lose the time, the opportunity to enjoy sensual pleasures, divine pleasures. Now see the dilemma. If he want to enjoy uh, divine pleasure, he has to think that he is wrong. Sakra is right. But he cannot think. And this is the dilemma. Buddha said, similarly, our fetters, our fetters are even stronger than this bondage of Vepachitti. Why is that? Because people never think sensual pleasure, anything wrong in the sensual pleasures. They never think. There is a big wall uh, in front of them. They cannot break through the wall of ignorance. And therefore, they remain there. They have to use mindful reflection. When we come to the next section of uh, Bodhjanga section, we will discuss that in more detail. Mindful reflection to crack the wall of ignorance, break the wall of ignorance. And therefore, as long as they are bound by these five places, five, these five places also uh, is important. What are the five places? Why five places uh, is used? Five cord of sensual sense pleasures. And people are bound by these five cord of sensual pleasures. We always want to enjoy our eyes, please our eyes, delight our eyes, nose, ears, tongue and body and the mind is the one that enjoys all this through these five cord of pleasures and the mind does not want to uh, get rid of them because mind enjoys, mind is this Vepachitti Bandhan, Vepachitti. Vepachitti word itself is very interesting, Vepachitti means distorted mind. Chitta means mind, Vepa Chitta means distorted. That is the name for the distorted mind. Distorted mind always thinks uh, pain is pleasure. Five senses, six senses, Buddha said, six senses are suffering. But we never want to think that they are suffering. And they delight in suffering. That's why Buddha said, those who delight in eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind, delight in suffering. And arising of suffering, is the arising of sense pleasure is the arising of suffering. And we, can, we never want to think that way. And therefore, uh, we have a struggle within ourselves. So, Buddha said, 
use this Swakata Dhamma. Uh, Sandittika Dhamma. Uh, one day, when the Upavana asked the Buddha, Bhante, what is this Sandittika Dhamma? Self evident Dhamma. Directly visible Dhamma. What is directly visible? Then Buddha said, Here, Upavana, having seen a form with the eye, a bhikkhu experiences the form as well as lust for the form. Since that is so, Upavana, the Dhamma is directly visible, Sandhitika, immediately effective, inviting to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. That's what we say, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammu, Sandhitiko, Akaliko, Ehi Pasiko, Opanaiko, that means, see this, this is what we say, Dhammesu Dhamma Anupasi Viharati. See this Dhamma, the way how the Dhamma works within ourselves. That is called Dhammesu Dhamma Anupasivirata means Sanditthiko Dhammo. See the Dhamma, the way how the Dhamma works within ourselves. Sanditthika. Seeing personally within oneself. Directly visible. Sanditthika means directly visible. Uh, Akalika means unaffected by time. When this situation arises in our mind, the moment we see object, that moment along with the seeing, along with seeing the object, all these ten series of things happen. That is, uh, you know, consciousness, recognition, uh, what you call um, contact and uh, attention, feeling, uh, thinking, deliberation, uh, greed, all these, one after the other, very quickly, all, the, all of them arise. It, sometimes it happens so quickly that you think they are all already there. They are not already there. They arise when the situation arises, they arise, in, almost immediately, almost simultaneously. And this is called uh, directly visible. We don't uh, go through any agent. Uh, we don't need agents to see these things. Agent is words, concepts, ideas, beliefs, views. These are agents. When the senses and sensory objects come in contact, what happens immediately after that does not require any word to interpret. Some people say, when you see, you must say, seeing, 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 seeing. You block your direct visibility. When you say the word seeing, 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 or experiencing, 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 something like that, if you use one concept, any word, then you are immediately visible dhamma become invisible because of introduction of the agent. This is called directly visible. That is, there is no mediator in between. Akalika unaffected by time. That means immediately effective. In this case, immediately effective. And this immediately effectiveness 
is the is unchangeable nature of Dhamma. It is true today, it was true then, it will be true in future. In that sense also it is unaffected by time. So Akalika, the word Akalika you can see in the Pali recital. Uh, I think this passage of the description of Dhamma is very important for everybody to memorize. Uh, when we, we practice Dhamma Anupasana, to Dhamma Anupasana is seeing Dhamma in accordance with its happening. See the phenomenon as it is happening. That is called Dhamma Anupasana. Uh, anupasana means along with the happening we must see. Seeing while it is happening. Not before nor after. So Dhamma Anupasana means see the Dhamma as it happens. So that is uh, that is why Buddha said to Venerable Upavana, uh, having seen the form with the eye, I think you all read this passage in the Sanyutta Nikaya, uh, volume 4, page 41. Uh, the word, the, the passage, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammu etc. Buddha has explained the meaning of that passage. And that is directly applicable to the practice of Dhamma Anupasana. Dhamma Anupasana means seeing the Dhamma as it happens, as Buddha explained, having seen a form with the eye, a bhikkhu experiences the form as well as the lust for the form. Rupa Raga Pat Sangvedi. Rupa Raga Pat Sangvedi. Now, in the case of the Buddha, Rupa Raga Pat Sangvedi is very also important. In the case of the Buddha and Arahant, they also see visual, visual objects. They hear auditory sound. They smell that can be smelled. Taste, touch. But they know that, but they don't have a raga in those experiences. That is why it is said, Rupa uh, Patisangvedi Tathagato, Na Rupa Raga Patisangvedi. Buddha knows, Buddha knows the object, but no, with, the, with the knowing object, he does not have greed, clinging, craving for the object. Saddha Patisangvedi Tathagato na Saddha Raga Patisangvedi. Patisangvedi means knowing, experiencing well. So, since that is so, that means the bhikkhu knows the object and the blast arising with, the seeing, the, with seeing the object. Since that is so, Upavana, the Dhamma is directly visible, immediate, uh, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. So when we see this, you can see the feta arising. This is how we, we must see the feta arising. And then, uh, whenever we talk about, when we, we say the Dhamma, we don't simply mean uh, something wholesome all the time. Any, any, any mental phenomena is called Dhamma. This is a mental phenomena. When this phenomena occurs, we become fully aware of it and see how uh, lust 
involved in it. This is one example, uh, hatred and uh, conceit. Through the eyes, conceit can arise. Buddha said uh, the conceit can arise through our senses. Uh, through eyes, ears, nose, and so forth, conceit arise. That also we can see. When we see an object, immediately there arises sometimes comparison. See how uh, superior I am, or how inferior I am, how equal I am with the other person. So conceit can arise. arise. Somebody said this, I mean, somebody show, pointed to the footnote in this book uh, that this is not uh, talking about the kind of fetters that we get rid of when we attain enlightenment. Uh, in this, uh, uh, Buddha, Buddha did not make any distinction between one uh, fetter and another. He just simply said fetters. Conceit is one of the fetters. Conceit is not uh, a hindrance. Conceit can arise uh, when any time when the senses and sensory objects come together. So, uh, when we mindfully pay pay mindful what you call exercise mindful reflection. Uh, then Buddha said, we can see the world arising through our senses. In the Buddha's term, uh, we have to become mindful of rising of the Dhamma and disappearing of the Dhamma. Samudaya Dhamma Anupasiva Dhamma Suviharati why dhamma anupasiva dhamma suherati? That you can see in the text. Uh, we can see this particular dhamma fading away when we use another dhamma. That is, when we pay, when we pay mindful uh, reflection. When we do mindful reflection, that dhamma, that uh, fetter that is already arisen, slowly fade away. So we can see it passing. It doesn't pass away by itself. We go to exercise mindful reflection. Then we see it is going passing away. Uh, and we also see visual objects. Uh, 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 the seeing itself is not something permanent. Seeing is impermanent. Visual objects are not permanent. They are impermanent. And whatever arises through this impermanent uh, uh, combination of senses and sensory objects also is impermanent. So the phenomenon that arises is not permanent phenomena. It is impermanent phenomena. And this is how the Dhamma becomes uh, Dhamma fades away, disappears. Here Dhamma means this very particular phenomena fades away. <coughs> the, when the senses are impermanent, sensory objects are impermanent, whatever arising from these impermanent senses and sensory objects also are impermanent. That you can see. So, Buddha said, whatever is subject to disintegration, Ananda, is called the world. He used, he, he defined the world, lujjati palujjati, that which is, that which uh, breaks, disappears, that is called world. Because one day, Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Venerable Sir, it is said, the world the world. In what way, Venerable Sir, is it the world? He said, whatever is subject to disintegration, Ananda is called the world 
in the noble one's dispensation. And what is subject to disintegration? Then Buddha said, the I, Ananda, is subject to disintegration, forms, eye consciousness, eye contact, whatever feeling arises with the eye contact as condition, that too is subject to disintegration. That applies to ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. And then another phenomenon, he explained. In this Dhamma that we experience, we don't now that is impermanence. This Dhamma we experience is impermanent. It's, since the objects are impermanent, senses are impermanent, whatever arising through these impermanent senses, sens sensory objects, also impermanent. And also they are empty. So, Buddha said, world is empty. Sunya, uh, sunyata loka. So, answering Venerable Ananda's question, Buddha said, Ananda, because it is empty of self, whenever the word empty or sunya uh, is used in the Buddha's dispensation, it simply means empty of self. Uh, it is empty of self and of whatever belongs to self that it is the empty that it is said the empty is the world and what is empty of self and what belongs to the uh, what belongs to self the I Ananda is empty of self and what belongs to self, forms are empty of self, and so forth, ears, sound, empty of self, smell, taste, empty of self, and so forth. So this goes on uh, for a long time, but I want to uh, sh show a few um, examples of how uh, which feta arise uh, when and how in order to conclude this little uh, uh, discussion because this is a also a very long long section uh, it's better not to get involved in too many details uh, fetters as you all know are ten uh, These fetters, I just want to uh, use this chart for you to uh, have a sort of a visual uh, aid to remember. Uh, easy to remember. Okay. Whenever we talk about fetters, uh, these fetters don't arise in our mind in this particular order. Always remember whenever we show a list, they do not occur in our mind exactly in the way the order, uh, in the way the list is given. Underneath the, the main uh, uh, fetter, of all of them, actually two of them, main, that is ignorance and uh, uh, craving. Ignorance and craving are the two main fetters. And everything else 
arise from these two fetters. If somehow, by some magic, if you can destroy craving forever completely, then everything else collapses. Even ignorance collapses. Why? Craving cannot exist without ignorance. Ignorance cannot exist without craving. Now here we have uh, four stars which represent hindrances. Doubt, craving, ill will and restlessness. And there is another hindrance which is not here that is sleepiness and drowsiness. It does not belong to fetters. It is just a hindrance. Now, keeping these ten fetters in mind, uh, let us see how uh, these uh, fetters arise in our mind through our senses. Of course, uh, we always deal with the world through our senses. Only when senses and sensory objects come together, all these things trigger. All these fetters can trigger. Say, I can pick any, any of them, it does not matter which. Uh, you see, uh, say for instance number five, ill will. Ill will becomes a fetter, so long as it remains uh, glued to our mind. It remains glued to our mind. Occasionally, we trim its uh, gross parts through the practice of mindfulness, concentration, uh, and that trimming the top is like uh, getting rid of hindrances. Uh, ill will can become a hindrance and um, we get rid of it and gain concentration, then we are calm, peaceful, relaxed and so forth. But the root of ill will remains in our mind. Where will remain the root in the mind? In ignorance and greed. Ill will cannot arise without greed, craving and ignorance. <coughs> we, can, we hate somebody or something, some situation, because we do not get what that being, that situation, that person to do what we want, what we like. So, craving involves. And not realizing uh, why craving, why ill will arises because of craving is because of our ignorance. And therefore, no matter how many times we get rid of our fet, uh, uh, hindrance of ill will, the root of ill will stays there. So, ill will is uh, one of the three roots. What are the three cardinal roots? Greed, hatred and delusion. Hatred is here, Delusion comes from ignorance and then root of ill will is nourished. And that is why ill will becomes a fetter, the root of defilements. 
Now, when we uh, Buddha said, uh, know the senses, sensory objects, and the fetter arising through this, through the contact, feeling, and so forth, be uh, uh, go through these five stages that are given here. Unarisen fetter, so first you know there is no fetter. Then you see unarisen fetter arising. Then you use your mindful reflection. Then the fetter fades away. Then you know the fetter is gone. Then you know the, the fetter that is gone does not come back. This happens <coughs> on the cushion, outside the cushion, anytime, anywhere. Fetter can arise. Hindrance can arise during on the cushion during meditation. What arises during meditation on the cushion is a hindrance for that particular practice. If it repeats daily, every day, here and there, whether sitting, standing, walking, lying down, talking, working, then it is a fetter. Because it keeps bugging our mind. It never leaves us alone. It always follows us. When it keeps following us all the time, then we know that it is a fetter, not a hindrance. It hinders the mind because it remains as a fetter in our mind. So temporarily when we, we, we get rid of it, and since we have been able to get rid of it temporarily, for that reason, at that time, that particular uh, factor is called hindrance. Since it, is, since it follows us all the time in our life, we call it a fetter. So you can see the difference between fetter and hindrance. Uh, any of these things can become a, become a hindrance, but uh, uh, not all of them become hindrance. Ignorance is not considered to be a hindrance. Why? Because ignorance is always there. Uh, clinging to rites and rituals is not a hindrance. Why? Because it is always there. And the craving for fine material existence is not a hindrance. Because it is always there. Conceit for immaterial um, uh, existence, craving for immaterial existence, we should add craving here too, uh, are not hindrances because they are there all the time. But these things, restlessness is temporary. It can go away. Ill will, you can get rid of it temporarily. Sensual craving and doubt. Since we, uh, we will be able to temporarily get rid of them and uh, only to attain concentration, with ignorance we can attain concentration. We do not have to get rid of ignorance to attain concent gain concentration. It is uh, a very known uh, factor that even the Buddha's teachers had a lot of ignorance and they still gain concentration. So, uh, fetter, when the sense, sensors and sensory objects come together, when uh, one of these arises, whether in, uh, particularly in uh, uh, in a situation where uh, we try to remain calm and peaceful, these things arise and keep troubling our mind all the time. Nothing works to get rid of them. And that is the time 
we have to understand these stages. Understand the arising of it. We don't have to sit in one place. We don't have to concentrate on the breathing. We don't have to find particular posture, place, time. Whenever it arises, we understand this is a fetter. This is bothering me all the time. And then use mindful reflection. For mindful reflection also there is no time, place and situation. Anytime, anywhere, as soon as this arises, we use mindful reflection. When we use mindful reflection, we can see the uh, the the fetter that is arisen. Uh, it arises. Uh, that it passes away. And when you stay with mindful reflection, for that time, for that day, it may be. Uh, for the whole day, uh, you may be working with people, doing various things, that fetter does not arise that for the whole day, because your mindful reflection is working quite well. And then you know, gee, this morning I had it, now it is not, it is not in my mind. For the whole day you can say, my fetter is gone. It doesn't come back. So if we keep this exercise practicing, then we can hold it for, a, for two days, three days, a week, a month, and then we know it's gone. Then only we know that the fetter has left our mind. We have to see the duration of the absence of that particular fetter. Not only sitting on the cushion, when we sit in the, on the cushion it goes away and that time we know it is gone, then we know it is a hindrance, it simply temporarily left the mind, so I can proceed with my concentration. Out of cushion, when it arises, we deal with mindful reflection and it goes away, then you know, even though you don't gain concentration, even though you are not on the cushion, you are engaged in various activities, your mind is temporarily for one day is free from this fetter. If the fet hindrance is not like that, hindrance arises quickly, it passes away quickly for that particular reason, for that particular place, for that particular pur purpose. The there is a per when, when we practice, uh, when we uh, deal with hindrances, we know uh, it hinders attaining our concentration. So that is our goal. Uh, therefore, we simply push them away. So we achieve the goal for that per that particular period of time. Once we come out of it, it comes back. Fetter is not like that. Once you learn to get rid of fetter, it will stay away for a long period of time, not during concentration meditation. Because fetter is something that we deal with mindfulness, mindful reflection. Con uh, the uh, hindrance is the mental factor that we get rid of with concentration meditation. So what we gain only through concentration meditation, get rid of through concentration meditation is something temporary. What we get rid of with uh, mindful reflection is more durable. So uh, this is how this is another way of knowing the difference between fetter and hindrance. So it takes a long time for us to work with each of these fetter, and we come. We in the in the on the other hand, we must recognize what the fetters are. 
not only remembering the list. Remembering the list is very easy. But understanding, recognizing, and knowing what the fetter and what the hindrance is, is different, difficult. For instance, belief in permanent self has nothing to do with concentration. It has nothing to do with concentration. You can get concentration with believing self. But in order to penetrate the truth, this becomes a fetter. The, uh, we mentioned uh, 20 types of uh, uh, fetters, what you call 20 types of uh, belief in self. Uh, but these 20 can become even more than 20 uh, by s s seeing uh, that this is uh, uh, I am self, self is mine, uh, I am body, body is mine, I am feeling, feeling is mine and so forth. We can multiply these 20 into 40 by trying to identify each of them separately. And that is how it becomes a fetter. Where is that list? <laughs> okay. I do not have time to go through this, I just want to run it very quickly. <coughs> uh, some of you all may have seen this. Who has not seen this? Marshall, have you seen it? This list? Uh, what is the heading? Heading is stages of enlightenment. Yeah. You have it? You have it here now, today? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have not uh, seen it in previous uh, retreats? Any other retreat? Valerie? No? Who else? You have seen Anne? Huh? Okay. Who else? You have? Yeah, you have seen it. You have seen it. Okay. This is, uh, when you look at it, it is self explanatory. Uh, we can give you the list later on and you can see. Uh, I, I made this list, <coughs> this chart particularly to uh, remove some of the confusions that people have with regard to the attainment of enlightenment. <coughs> some people think all this happened in a split second. For instance, uh, this uh, attainment of uh, uh, Sotapanna uh, stream entry, all these will disappear in a split second and then you are, this moment you are in the path, next moment you are in the fruition and finish. We cannot find that anything to substantiate that statement in the sutras. <coughs> Sutra says you enter the path and cultivate it, develop it, practice it master it, then you attain the fruition. You follow the path. So maggam bhaveti bahuli karoti, Buddha said. So attain the stage and multiply, cultivate, practice, mature, grow, then you will reap the, reap the results. And in I, I refer to another discourse in Majjhima Nikaya. I like people to see that. And also in the uh, Vandana book, in, in the description of the Sangha, uh, in many places it is mentioned, Atta Purusa Puggala, eight individual persons. In the Sangha Vandana you can see Atta Purusa Puggala, uh, eight individual persons. Eight individuals means 
those who are in the pad stage and those who are in the fruition stage. That means four pads and four fruition. That's how you get eight. In the uh, Dakina Vibhanga Sutta, Buddha gave uh, a list of uh, 14 individual offerings and eight of them are those who are in the fruition, path stage and fruition stage. If the path and fruition happens instantly within split second, how can you find two individuals in the stream entry? You can never find it. And therefore, we then next question arises, how do you know when somebody is in the path stage how do you know when somebody is in the fruition stage? Now, we divide this into these three. When you practice the path, what is the path? What is our path? Noble Eightfold Path. In Sangyuti Nikaya, uh, uh, Buddha said, answering uh, Venerable Ananda's question, Buddha said the path uh, sorta. Sota means stream. Sota also means the Noble Eightfold Path. Sota means Noble Eightfold Path. When Noble Eightfold Path become supra mundane level, it becomes Sota. And entering that level is called Sota Panna. One enters that level by destroying one of these fetters not necessarily uh, in this order, you may overcome your doubt. For example, the moment you overcome your doubt, you are in the stream entry path. So, you keep practicing Noble Eightfold Path from that point onward. I mean, you have been practicing Noble Eightfold Path for long period of time to get rid of your doubt. And then you become Sotapanna. And the path you follow becomes Supramandas Eightfold Path. Up to that point, you follow this Noble Eightfold Path, but it is not called Supramandas. The moment you are able to destroy one of these fetters, then your path is called Supramandas Path. In that Supramandas Path, you have the same eight Noble Eightfold steps. And you practice it, practice, practice, then you may destroy uh, attachment to rules and rituals. And still you are in stream entry path. Then when you destroy the last one, you are stream entry fruition stage. Same thing goes with the second. When you, when you weaken sensual craving, weaken means that you lose interest. That's all. You lose interest. You have not eradicated. You totally lose interest in it. You are in the once returners path. When you lose interest in ill will, you are in the one sitters fruition stage. When you destroy sensual craving, you are in the never returners path. When you destroy ill will, you are in the never returners fruition stage. Every time you follow this, when you attain this, then you step into the next level and you keep practicing, then you lose interest in this. Then you are once return as path. Then you lose interest in the other one, remaining one. It does not matter, one of these two. Then you are stream in a uh, once return as fruition stage. Because in this stage, you do not destroy anything. You just weaken them. When you weaken two fetters, how do you know which is, how do you know whether you are in the fruition stage of 
fat state. Only way to know is when you destroy one, you are in the fruition state. I mean, when you weaken one, you are in the fruition state. When you weaken the other, you are, I'm sorry, when you weaken one, you are in the bad state. When you weaken the other, you are in the fruition state. And same thing, when you destroy one of them, you are in the path stage of the anagami, non-returner. And when you destroy the other, you are in the fruition stage. Same thing goes with the, this. Here, this is the last to destroy, ignorance. Before that, you can destroy any of them. When you destroy one of them, you are in the arahanthood path. And keep destroying another one, another one, another one. Five, four of them you can destroy while being in the arahanthood path. When you destroy the last one, you are in the arahanthood fruition stage. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, it is very l long thing. We normally uh, follow many types of rituals. <laughs> if I were to mention some of them, you may be shocked, although we ourselves follow them. Say, for instance, uh, ritualistically we take the precept. Every day we recite. That's a ritual. And we stick to it. And we say, uh, let me close this. And we say, I take the precept every day. So I'm better than others. I never forget to recite my precept. I get up in the morning, I recite my precept. I go to bed, I recite my precept. What does that do to you? You will be proud, arising another fetter. So you follow one fetter that is attached to the rules and regulations. Out of that you build up another fetter becoming proud. I am better than others. Others never recite. I never heard them reciting the precept. I recite every day. So, that becomes a fetter. Mm, if you sacrifice your interviews, I can go on. <laughs> So we uh, close our session. <laughs>